Hello, it is now 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You have joined the Using Data and Prosecutor-Led Behavioral Health Diversions webinar. To allow for additional signees past the hour, we will start the webinar in a few minutes. Good afternoon. I am Demetrius Thomas, Deputy Program Director at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Thank you for joining today's Using Data and Prosecutor Led Behavioral Health Diversion Webinar. Today's webinar is funded by the US Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance, commonly referred to as BJA, and done in collaboration with the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, commonly referred to as APA. To give you an overview of today's webinar, first I will introduce the speaker, then there will be a brief overview on the Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA, and the Council of State Governments, CSG Justice Center. After that, there will be a brief overview of APA. We will then go into our presentation, which will include introductions and information from the program's highlight staff on their prosecutorial engagement work, followed by a speaker and panelist Q&A, and then finally, there will be a larger discussion portion where you can discuss prompted questions about prosecutorial engagement, followed by a quick closeout. Anytime during the webinar, you can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and entering your question. This includes both technical and content related questions. We will try to reply to technical questions in the chat as we go. For the content related questions, we will keep a running list and address them at the end of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please click on the links dropped into the chat box. Please understand that there are some technical questions that we may not be able to answer. We are recording the webinar and will post it on our website as soon as possible. Today, we are joined by speaker Rebecca Neville, she is the state attorney and member of the general counsel team at APA. Prior to joining APA, Rebecca worked in family law and served as assistant state's attorney in Prince George's County, Maryland. She prosecuted general misdemeanor crimes and specialized in domestic and family violence cases involving spouses, families, and intimate partners. Rebecca obtained her JD and master's in social work from the Catholic University of America and worked in the social service field prior to attending law school. I'm Demetrius Thomas, Deputy Program Director in the Behavioral Health Division at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I, am, I oversee the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, technical training and assistance grantees. Prior to joining the Justice Center, I worked for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where I oversaw 
the program's initiatives at the intersection of criminal justice and mental health, mental and behavioral health, including establishing New York City's first ever diversion centers and co-response and mobile crisis teams. Next, I'll provide overviews on the mission of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA, CSG Justice Center, and the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, which we commonly refer to as JMHCP. The Council of State Governments, I'm sorry, the US Department of Bureau of Justice of Assistance mission is to make communities safer by strengthening the nation's, the nation's criminal justice system. It grants training and technical assistance and political and policy development services provide state, local, and indigenous nations with the cutting edge tools and best practices they need to reduce violent and drug related crimes, support law enforcement and to combat, um, combat victimization. The Council of State Governments Justice Center, the Justice Center is a national nonprofit nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association representing state officials in all three branches of government with the expertise of a policy and research team focused on assisting others to attain measurable results. Our staff develops research-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. This slide here describes a bit more about our work style and how we strive to reflect Justice Center core values, which includes a commitment to being independent and nonpartisan in every aspect of our work, providing vigorous, trusted, high quality analysis, developing practical and innovative solutions informed by data and research, promoting collaboration and building consensus, and being inclusive and respectful of diverse views and expectations. The goal of the JMHCP grant program is to develop collabor collaborations across the criminal justice and behavioral health systems from law enforcement, pretrial, court, jails, and community supervision. To learn how to have successful partnerships that increase efficiencies and improve public safety and outcomes for people with mental and behavioral health conditions and co-occurring substance use disorder involved in the criminal legal system. I now will kick it over to Rebecca, who will give a brief overview on the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. Rebecca. Thank you so much, Demetrius. And thank you to our wonderful attendees for joining us today. I also want to give a special thank you to um, BJA as well and our presenters who are here today, Redondo Beach City Attorney Michael Webb, Senior Deputy City Prosecutor Joy Abaquin, and King County Senior Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Leandra Kraft, who are joining us and will be formally introduced later in this program to highlight their work in this space. Uh, the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys is a national nonprofit whose mission is to support and enhance the effectiveness of prosecutors in their efforts to create safer communities through a more just and equitable legal system. APA is a leader in the field of nationwide training and technical assistance. Our membership includes prosecutors' offices, elected, appointed, and line prosecutors, justice system professionals, and community partners. Our staff includes experienced attorneys, is led by elect, practicing elected and appointed prosecutors. And through numerous projects, advisory boards, and collaborative efforts, APA helps jurisdiction implement innovative and effective prosecutorial practices. And I believe I will turn it back to you, Demetrius, for our presentation on um, data and, and working with data collection. Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca, and thanks for joining us. Um, as you can see from this slide, the importance of data collection. Data can be used to gain support, allies, and champions in the work that you do. You can also use data to report on outcome measures that tell the story of why your program is working, and this can be used to obtain funding and also to support sustainability of your program. Having data that supports the success of your program is critical in, sustain in all sustainability efforts. Data can also be used as an opportunity to identify and correct gaps in the program, specifically equity gaps involving those most impacted by the systems, including race, gender, and those who lack housing and et cetera. There are three types of data that can be collected through research and program evaluation. The first is qualitative. Qualitative addresses the how and why of programmatic data. Data is not, qualitative data is not generalized across the population. 
The other type is quantitative. It addresses the what and how and how many of programmatic data. This data can be generalized across the population. And the third mixed, mixed message is just that. It is a research study designed to be in, interpreted using both qualitative and quanti qualitative methodologies. Though this is typically the hardest methodology to use, it is often the most robust and tells a more complete story using the data collected. Program staff should determine the best research design based on what story you wish to convey to your audience and the purpose of the story you wish to tell. This slide highlights some important data collection considerations, which includes one, to garner consideration and buy-in, and buy-in um, to tell this story. Do I need? You should be thinking: Do I need to collect data? What type of data do I need to collect? Um, how do I analyze? And do I need to collect data and analyze from multiple agencies? If you determine that you do, you should be thinking about what do I need to accomplish to meet these goals. In addition. So considering the focus of the story you want to tell your audience and what the story is about, you will need to consider some practical things such as, is there a standard definitions for all of the program and outcome measures that you are using throughout your program? And is it widely understood by the audience that you are looking to attract? You should also think about certain special circumstances that could impact your data, your data collection and your data analysis, such as COVID-19. I will now kick it over to, to Rebecca, who will speak specifically about how you can incorporate some of these ideas into specifically working with prosecutors and understanding their role in diversion programs. Rebecca. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Yes, I'm going to briefly touch on the prosecutor's role in working with prosecutors and some strategies to engage with prosecutors in diversion um, around data. So I want to start off with, this is actually going to be different in every jurisdiction. Um, a prosecutor's role in diversion, and that's for a number of reasons. A, the specific office or community priorities, the communities have different needs and um, who may be the best messenger for that, for that diversion program may be different. Um, there are statutory structures that may allow or disallow certain involvement from the prosecutor in terms of how a diversion program is established and as well as available resources. Available resources is a common concern for many, many entities and many stakeholders when um, organizing a diversion program, as all of you know very well. And so how a prosecutor engages and the prosecutor's role is going to be shaped by many of those um, competing factors. So when you are going to start out engaging the prosecutor in, in creating or revising a diversion program, you're gonna to wanna to do your research first. Understanding the community's priorities, um, the priorities of the office. Many offices have campaign websites for elected prosecutors or web pages that just list out their priorities and their policies surrounding what they're doing. Um, again, prosecutors are people who are really very dedicated to the, the communities that they're serving, um, and they have a strong desire to do what's best. They've really taken this role um, to serve their community and want to collaborate to to find ways to best um, approach public safety and justice. And so they're really understanding what their priorities are and how they can overlap with what program you're suggesting or proposing or planning um, or are currently running um, is always very helpful. And many offices looking up current programs and office partners, many offices already have active diversion programs for certain crimes, certain ways to deflect um, certain charges. And so maybe there are certain and current programs that you are able to find and fit into in that regard. And you should also insert research an individual. If you're going to speak with someone in the office, understanding that person's educational and biographical information can help create a connection. If they're a lifelong community resident, or they've just moved to the area and transitioned from another office and looking to do something innovative and different. Um, understanding where someone comes from is, is very helpful when you're beginning any collaboration, regardless of role or, or prosecutor, prosecutorial experience. And then engaging collaborative partners in efforts, reaching out to other treatment providers in your area or anyone who's worked with the prosecutor's office in the past. Again, if there's offices that are having active diversion programs and have treatment partners they already engage with, can you connect to them and, and see how 
and who might be the best person who is already doing this work within the office um, and can possibly meet with you while chatting with the prosecutor. We can go to the next slide. So, oh, sorry, go back one for me. Uh, thanks. So working with prosecutors to create a data strategy. When you're going to do any diversion program or you're going to create any sort of program that um, will need to be informed by creating a framework for data governance. Where is this data going to be housed? Who, what is going to be important to measure? Who's responsible for collecting this data and, and how? Um, a first step may be and will be defining the mission of the program and how success can be measured. What will success look like for this diversion program? That's a crucial first step and will inform the rest of the work that you do around creating a framework for data governance. Um, having some possible answers to these questions will be very helpful um, when you're meeting with the prosecutor's office in regard to, to a program that you're running or, or hope to run, um, but definitely being open to modification and existing systems that may be helpful in this space. And addressing any concerns about information sharing with each other and other entities, um, treatment providers, prosecutor offices, other criminal justice stakeholders who will be involved have different obligations and different roles regarding how they're able to share information and what information they can share. Understanding those roles and those obligations very early in this engagement process will be extremely helpful for working out any challenges and streamlining communication down the road and um, sharing that data that needs to be shared and working around ways that you can't share data, what it is you can do um, so that you have a working relationship and understanding. And work with prosecutors to map out a flexible database structure that considers implementation measures. There's of course no one size fits all in diversion. So looking at the feasibility of the collection of data, is there adaptability to everyday use as you're considering what to measure and making sure that you have a section for for really, if you can't measure something, can you make note of what it is and why there's an outlier in that case? Um, consider other research and program evaluation touch points that may be able to benefit from this data. Are, you, are there learning opportunities in other programs who are already operating that are measuring what you wish to measure? Um, are you able to connect with them? Are you able to, able to overlap systems? And can you identify any other challenges to data collection analysis and how you might overcome them? Um, walking through how the data will work, the possibility of a pilot program to discern what new challenges will arise as your program begins and becomes operational can be very helpful in working through these challenges. Um, next slide. Thank you. And so the crux of successful diversion and data strategy um, when creating this framework for data governance is regular communication and collaboration. Um, formulating a working group with key members from all stakeholders is critically important to continuing to streamline communication, having regular communication, and understanding um, each person's role in this program and in this collaboration. So create periods for reporting periods for data collection, sharing, analysis, and evaluation. This can be daily, quarterly, annually, um, I'm sure all of you are creating data in some way, are reviewing and interpreting data in some way already. And so how will your program fit into what's already existing, what's already being collected, and how will you share it? Adjusting these early, setting them early, and then being able to adjust them based on what data comes in or what data you are able to um, challenges arise will be, will be very important. Again, this is a flexible process when, when engaging with prosecutors and in diversion programs as well. And so scheduling regular and frequent meetings with working groups, with your working group to discuss data collection and the policy implications. Maybe that first round of data you use to inform your program um, policies and practices and what you can do to make it stronger before you share it externally. How can you use that data collection? How can you interpret that data um, to, to really inform what your, what your program is doing, how it's defining success, and remembering um, to the mission at hand and the mission and the success of your program. And so determine how the data will be used to inform that program. It can help you make policy shifts. You can learn where there's communication or treatment gaps. Is there a treatment gap that you've been seeing in the, in the participants of this program? Um, it can help with things like staff workload. 
are there shifts in staff workload that can help um, help the feasibility of this program and determining its success? We'll go to the next slide. So the data is collected. Let's say you've now created your working group, found a great research partner, let's say from a local college to help you interpret the data you have, and you've got six months of data. Um, this is certainly, I, I want to, to frame this as an overgeneralization. I'm sure as you all are aware, this process can take up to a year or more. But once you have the data and you're ready to share it or you're ready to review it, um, what, what should you be considering? First, you should be considering who's your audience. Are you providing this information to the community to let them know what your program is doing? Are you sharing this information with the media to let them know what your program is doing? Are you sharing this with your um, other treatment partners or funders? How is, this, how is this information going to be received by your audience? And remembering the goal of your information sharing. And that goes right alongside the audience. How, what is the goal and what is the purpose of your sharing this information? Um, for example, we have one, one, one office I know of shares data just to show the amount of the caseload that the prosecutors in their office are handling um, for that diversion program because it's very large. It's, it's such a great volume. Um, and they want to show how many people are really using these services, using this treatment program, and be able to show how many prosecutors are dedicated to this work. So it has a number of goals, uh, but understanding what the goals are is going to be really informative in terms of the complexity, how it comes across, and what uh, medium you use to share that data. And that goes to the complexity of data when you're sharing it. Which medium are you using? Are you putting it into a report, or are you going to share it on um, a data dashboard online, on, on a website? And have you emphasized any trends or patterns? Trends or patterns are very great ways to start recognizing gaps in the program, gaps in the treatment, gaps in um, even a, in the collaboration. There, should there be another partner at the table to, to help assist in this program success? And how will you be able to visualize your data? Again, that goes with the trends and patterns, how you can make them general, and how can you make your, can you make your data searchable um, depending on the audience and where it is where it is being housed. And can you provide in your visualization, can you provide general definitions? I think Demetrius talked about this, that sometimes definitions um, can be different across disciplines. And of course, that is certainly the case in criminal justice and behavioral health. So when you're visualizing your data, are you providing ways for people to be able to interpret it, your audience to interpret that data um, using the definitions that you are providing? And we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. So, Keeping all of those points in mind when you're engaging with prosecutors, when you're working on a diversion program, we're now going to hear from some wonderful site presenters and presentations um, from prosecutors who have used data in some way in their diversion programs. And so if we could do a small introduction, thank you so much. And we have with us a very special guest who's actually not listed here, and it is Redondo Beach City Attorney, Michael Webb. We also have with us Redondo Beach Senior Deputy um, City Prosecutor Joy Abaquin Ford and King County Senior Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Leandra Kraft. By way of brief introduction, uh, Mike, Michael Webb is the City Attorney for the City of Redondo Beach. He's one of 11 elected City Attorneys in California and he is currently serving his fifth term as City Attorney, having been first elected in 2005 and then re-elected in 2009, 2013, 2017, and 2021 most recently. Prior to being elected city attorney, Mike served for 18 years as city prosecutor, deputy city prosecutor, and deputy district attorney. Mike received his BA in political science and economics from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1984, and he received his JD from the University of California, Hastings College of Law in 1987. Welcome, District Attorney Webb. We also have with us Joy Abaquin Ford, who is the Redondo Beach Quality of Life Prosecutor. She has been with the city of Redondo Beach since 2015. She prosecutes misdemeanor offenses involving illegal cannabis dispensaries, massage parlors, short-term rentals, and code enforcement violations. And in addition, she conducts administrative hearings and nuisance abatements on behalf of the city. She also oversees the city's response to homelessness program, which includes the Housing Initiative Court. She received her JD from the University of California, Davis, and a double bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley in rhetoric and philosophy. Welcome, Joy. Thank you so much for being here. 
And Leandra Kraft is the Vice Chair for the General Crimes Unit in King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office in King County, Washington. She supervises the Collaborative Justice Team, which houses LEAD, the Law Enforcement Assisted, Assisted Diversion, King County Drug Diversion Court, and the Vital Program through Familiar Faces. Leandra has worked in felony trials, hate crimes, drug court, regional mental health court, regional veterans court, and the Involuntary Treatment Act Court. I want to thank you all for being here today, um, sharing your time and your expertise and your experiences with our audience. Um, I know that the information that you will share is going to be incredibly useful to, to the work that the, our attendees are doing. And we're just very grateful for you um, being able to participate with us. I believe um, City Attorney Webb, you are going to start us off with a brief overview. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, I believe. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We can go to the next slide. We had, um, as many areas throughout California, had a crisis in the number of unhoused individuals. And in late spring of 2019, it, it reached a pitch where uh, the residents were complaining at virtually every city council meeting. And so the mayor and a majority of the council separately came to us and asked us to put together some sort of creative program to address this. And uh, they did so effective uh, July 1st. And we recommended a, an enhanced response to homelessness. And that involved many aspects. It started with meeting individually. Uh, Joy Abikin and, and one of our other prosecutors met and I met with all residents who had complained about homelessness to find out what their concerns were, what, why they thought uh, the response of the city had been inadequate. It also allowed us to have an interaction to explain to them recent court rulings with Martin versus Boise and why uh, the police activities were limited in some circumstances throughout the Ninth Circuit. We met with the police department to find their perspective and their frustration with having to respond to many calls uh, that were really uh, people going through untreated mental crises and the lack of mental health resources. And one of the um, concerns was that their act actions, even if they took enforcement <laughs> actions, they were ineffective because people wouldn't show up to court. And because of bail and overcrowding in LA County, and uh, many of them were committing quality of life crimes, trespass, um, dr um, drunk in public, intoxicated in public, um, they'd have to pick up so many of those to be held and there wouldn't be treatment, there wouldn't be effective response to enable people to overcome what was holding them back um, from becoming housed, from having their um, ment chronic mental Ill illnesses in many cases uh, drug addiction in many cases or combination be treated. We met with housing navigators to find out why the people they were working with, uh, the obstacles towards becoming, um, towards becoming permanently housed. And we came up with a process, a program that involved the first uh, transitional housing units. We had pallet shelters, uh, tiny homes that would allow people who are on the streets the ability to, be, to become stabilized. Uh, we have per, uh, permanent housing where we partner with the county and receive state grants to turn um, hotels into permanent supportive housing. But a central part of all of this was trying to get people into uh, court so we could bring the, the services to them. Uh, the housing navigators talked about the obstacles they'd have to meet, such as, you know, it can be very challenging for someone with chronic mental illness, no transportation, um, to be able to um, navigate the DMV system, to get an ID, to be able to get qualify for their benefits. So um, a central part of this is our housing initiative or homeless court. And that in, eventually involved bringing the court to the community outdoors, the first one in LA County, where the individuals already were and bringing all the resources they needed to overcome those obstacles. And the person that so effectively runs that program, um, Joy Abikin, I'm gonna turn over to her so she can go through the, the details of um, our housing initiative. Joy. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
Our, we originally started calling it Homeless Court. It has since changed to the Housing Initiative Court. Uh, it was started in July 2019 as a pilot program. And we were trying to focus on criminal defendants who had chronic mental illness, substance use disorders, and people who commit habitual offenses. Uh, I would note that you can see in this photo, which was taken in June 2020, that was our first graduate. Uh, so it took almost a year for him to start the process in court and then become permanently housed. Uh, next slide, please. And our program is a diversion program, meaning that when a defendant comes to court and follows certain orders of the judge, if they complete all those orders, obey all laws, and become permanently housed, we will dismiss their criminal cases. And um, that photo shows our outdoor court. It has since grown to add many other partners and programs that I'll mention later. Um, but basically, this is a collaborative court. It's not, uh, I'm not fighting with the public defenders. We're all working together with the judge, with the housing navigators to get a person stabilized and permanently housed. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, our ultimate goal is stabilization and permanent housing. On the way there, when a person first comes to court, the first order is normally to have them connect with a housing navigator and to get their ID. That'll be the first order of the judge. They'll come back next month and then uh, it, they might have lost their ID. So the next order will be, okay, go back to the Department of get two copies of your ID, one to give to your housing navigator and one to keep for yourself. Um, as uh, Mr. Webb mentioned that doc being document ready is an essential part of becoming uh, permanently housed. Next slide, please. So our partners, since we have moved outdoors, uh, and I would mention that we moved outdoors initially because of COVID. The courts shut down, we weren't hearing our cases, our um, defendants experiencing homelessness weren't able to meet with their housing navigator in court. So when we moved outdoors, a lot of agencies started asking us if they could be a part of our program. And now we have set up booths around the courtroom uh, for the Department of Mental Health. Uh, we have the public defender's expungement team to expunge their criminal records. So that is, it is easier for them to achieve permanent housing. We have a private partner that provides substance abuse and mental health counseling. We have um, substance abuse and detox program referrals, as well as a full service partnership for mental health. And as I mentioned, we have our housing navigators. We contract with three different uh, service providers as, and recently we hired our own city employed housing navigator. Next slide, please. So because we just started this in 2019, we are still in the process of what Rebecca was describing earlier and gathering all our data. But to give you some uh, frame of reference, we are a city of a population of more than 67,000 people. Our 2020 homeless point in time count was 176. There was no Los Angeles County point in time count in 2021 due to COVID. So we contracted with a service provider that conducted a census for us. So it, uh, for 2021, it was 92 people experiencing homelessness. Now it's uh, not a fair comparison because the point in time count does one night and uses a formula, whereas the service provider we contracted with counted um, persons that they spoke to over two days and some people were double counted but it does give us some idea of the progress we made. And um, in addition, I just completed our quarterly uh, report for our grants yesterday. So I think these numbers are from the last quarter. And just to give you a more updated uh, report, we had from January 58 unduplicated clients uh, come through our homeless court. We've had 29 cases dismissed. Currently we have 10 
people in interim housing. And we have had five graduations, meaning five people who have been permanently housed since January. Um, we also look at the attendance um, because in my 12 years of being a prosecutor, I have never seen a court calendar where every person has attended court. And this is a population known not to attend court because, because of their mental health illnesses or substance abuse addiction, or because it's just not a priority for them. Um, there are a lot of failure to peers, a lot of bench warrants. But uh, as you can see, we've had months where everyone comes to court. We've had a high success of attendance and it really has to do with the partnership with their homeless navigator. Uh, their homeless navigators bring them to court and um, reminds them to come to court. But it also has to do with the community that they fostered there. They want to come to court. They, when they get there and the judge calls their case and they come up and the judge asks them, how many days sober today, Ms. Scott? And she yells out, 600 days, Your Honor. Everyone is applauding, myself, the audience, the other defendants, the sheriffs, our police department, the public defenders, everyone is encouraging each other. When they come back to their seat, they're high-fiving each other. So they wanna to come to court. And being a prosecutor in this program, I'm very involved in their path to becoming stabilized, overcoming their sobriety and being permanently housed. So um, it's a great program. Prior to COVID, the police were um, was was seeing a lot of good anecdotal evidence that showed, um, you know, the crime data, arrest data, calls for service, customer satisfaction levels, community concerns, and public perception by utilizing some of the advanced technologies that recover raw public sentiment data. And after looking at a variety of data. Uh, it's very apparent that early on uh, into the pilot project, our actions have decreased our transient related calls for service, increased our customer satisfaction level, increased public perception of safety, decreased our community concern for homelessness, and decreased our property crimes and overall decreased our part one crimes levels in the city. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca to introduce the next speaker. Thank you both so much. And that is an incredibly innovative program. And at a time when people are really struggling with, with um, you know, fatigue and, and caseload backlogs, what an inspiring and um, just motivating way to address so many problems that people are dealing with and effectively. Um, so thank you so much, both of you, for the work that you do and for being here with us today, um, sharing that that data and, and that program. Happy um, to do so. Uh, when uh, I see questions in the chat, when do you want us to respond to those? I'm, if it's okay with you, um, City Attorney Webb, we're going to hold our questions until Leandra's um, done her site presentation. And then please, everyone, that's a great point. Thank you so much for reminding me. Everyone keep those questions coming in because we will address them in our Q&A session um, right after Leandra's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Joy and Michael. It was wonderful to hear about the programs going on in California. So like Rebecca mentioned, my name is Leandra Kraft. I am a senior deputy prosecutor with King County. And I just wanna start off by saying that when we're taking a look at this next program, the vital team through the Familiar Faces Initiative, Seattle and King County largely were taking a look at our homelessness crisis as well, along with the behavioral health issues and the drug addiction problem that our county was seeing. So in the early, 20, I mean, in 2010, our office, the King County Prosecutor's Office, started implementing a program that had to do with different partnerships between law enforcement, the prosecutor's office, um, the ACLU, and tried to figure out with those systems connecting, could people actually do better? And because of those results from that program that started in 2010, the county, King County Executive's Office, decided to say, 
Well, we've seen some positive results from connecting systems, including prosecutors and law enforcement for the folks that we see who are utilizing the criminal justice system. What if we give high utilizers more resources um, and, and don't involve law enforcement? Would that make a dent at all in the houseless crisis in King County? So that's sort of where the Familiar Faces Initiative was born in 2015. And you can go to the next slide, please. So the more resources that the King County Executive's Office was really thinking about was let's include the Seattle City Attorney's Office, let's fund a prosecutor to take a look at those high level utilizers, as well as the King County Prosecutor's Office. Let's get intensive case managers, which it sounds similar to the housing navigators that we heard about um, in uh, Redondo. Um, and so we also included an advanced registered nurse practitioner, housing, set aside housing for folks who are high utilizers, and as well as partnerships with other local hospitals. So we see UW Medicine that, and Harborview Medical Center. Those are the two largest hospitals in the Seattle and King County area. And if we added peer support, how would this impact the high utilizers in the King County jails? You can go to the next slide. And so in 2014, when the King County Executive's Office was deciding to start this initiative, the initiative thought to itself, okay, well, we are going to give these resources for these high utilizers. We know that the high utilizers of the jail likely have many low level and maybe some uh, more concerning uh, cases that are open currently with the King County Prosecutor's Office and the Seattle City Attorney's Office. So how are we going to use the data to figure out which folks we're going to target? And so familiar faces, the clients of this program, and I just wanna bring it back to, people can be a part of this program whether or not they are court involved, but because of the criteria to become a client of this program, there is a high likelihood that these folks are already court involved. So who can be defined as a familiar face? The person one has to have been booked four or more times within the King County Jail. There are two King County, uh, there are two jails that are counted in this um, booking. And that has had to happen within the past year. And in the past three years, there had to have been two years where the person was booked four or more times. And I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but essentially the person has to be booked eight or more times in the past three years. So consistently utilizing the jail. And then the third criteria is that the person had a behavioral health disorder. And for us, that means that the person has a mental health issue or chemical dependency issue such as uh, substance abuse. Next slide, please. And so when they were taking a look at what the initial numbers would be if we launched a program specifically to help the high utilizers with their legal involvement and their impact on the community, the first set was a, a little over a thousand and in 2014 was a little over a thousand as well. So 94% of those individuals had a behavioral health indicator when they were booked into the jail uh, because in our jail systems, and I'm sure that many of you all have seen this as well, uh, there's initial assessment when they come in, they may be uh, segregated if the behavioral health issues are extremely uh, difficult to manage. So one of the main drivers and the ways that the King County Executive's Office was to advocate for funding for this program it was to explain that for these high utilizers, these familiar faces who are constantly coming into contact with the jail, it was over $35 million that we were spending on these folks to jail them. And oftentimes because they were coming in due to crimes of poverty or crimes, a low level crimes, our, our courts were not holding them for very long. Sometimes charges weren't even being filed, um, but the cost that was associated to these high utilizers was increasingly apparent for the county. Next slide. And so this systems organization drawing graph is basically what 
So the thought process was when they were creating the entire initiative as a whole. If you can see on the left hand side, we see the familiar face. So those I identified as high utilizers of the King County Jail with behavioral health concerns. And then the vital program is right below to the right of the familiar face, which is their care management team. The care management team are their um, housing navigator, their uh, intensive case manager. It's people like me and other prosecutors who are taking a look at their legal involvement. Uh, it's their peer manager, it's their advanced registered nurse practitioner. All of that is to help those familiar faces clients get access to the outer ring, which is the physical behavioral health, employment, benefits, community, family, education, legal, you see spirituality. The team, the vital team is supposed to help that client get access to all of those systems around them, which will reduce what we see on the right hand side, which is um, calling our first responders, being involved in courts, um, having to use the drop-in centers and, and no consistency with actually their care. That was really the initial thought process of starting this program and starting a team that was intensively taking a look at these high utilizers. Next slide. And so this is really a definition of the vital team as a comprehensive and integrated services to adults who are experiencing beha behavioral health challenges and that they need intensive level of community based support and may be experiencing homelessness. And so the, what I want to say now is that we do also have a therapeutic courts in King County, we have our mental health court, we have our regional veterans court, we have adult drug diversion court. Um, and we have a community court. These are the folks that even going through those therapeutic court systems are not decreasing their usage of the jails or their contacts with the criminal justice system. It is a harm reduction based program and it is housing, a housing first approach. And when I say it is housing first so that we're all on the same page, these folks, once they become a vital client through the Familiar Faces Initiative. They're identified as a familiar face. They can be offered whether or not they wanna enter in the program. If they do choose to enter in the program, they have to sign a release of information between those healthcare providers and the prosecutor's offices that are involved. And they get the benefit of us taking a look at their cases if they're actually actively um, involved in their case management and reducing their harm. But there are no strings attached to having them be housed. So they can become a familiar faces client through the vital team and the next day be housed, regardless of if they have open cases, uh, regardless if they are still using, they can still be housed. Next slide. And so this is a picture graph of the vital team itself. So we saw a larger overview of the Familiar Faces Initiative early on through the executive office, but this is the vital team who's actually working with the familiar face. So like I mentioned, there is a care manager, which is um, their intensive case manager. There are occupational therapists, there are nurses, there's peer support, there are prosecutors that are part of this team, and there are psychiatric uh, medical providers as well. Next slide. So people often ask me, what do prosecutors actually do? Why are prosecutors involved in a program that is not tied to a case, but instead is tied to an individual? So there is actually a lot that the prosecutor has to do. When I say that it's a harm reduction case, if someone who is part of the vital program is not reducing their harm, even with all of those resources, because there's a release of information, we're getting that information from the case manager. And then I myself can say, or other prosecutors can say that that individual's case is going to be proceeding through the mainstream the criminal justice system as any other similar uh, situated defendant. So that means that that person will still get the benefit of providing medication to defense. Defense can talk about that to the assigned prosecutor. 
the, the fact that that person is a familiar face will not have any impact if they are not actually reducing their harm in being involved in the program. However, since we have that release of information, if we see and when we communicate between systems with the care providers, with our housing case manager, with medical staff, that the person actually is being consistent of um, you know, going into their check-ins, if they're being consistent with talking to their case manager, setting appointments, maybe they're on um, medicated assisted treatment now, and we can confirm that they're not picking up any new criminal charges, that is information that we use for those individuals to say, you know, maybe this case can be negotiated a little bit more creatively. Uh, maybe this person, maybe these cases that we have that are referrals, that there are no injured parties, maybe the referrals uh, can be declined. And so that is the large bandwidth of why we have one assigned prosecutor to the familiar faces program, because if a person is actually reducing their harm and we're getting that information independently, um, not from just their defense counsel, who of course will advocate for them, but independently from their case manager, we can really do a wide range of things from declining to file a case, from negotiating down a case, from um, dismissing a case even. And all of those things in between has happened for our one of our for at least a few of our familiar faces clients. And the reason that it is important to have a prosecutor involved is because everyone's plan as a familiar faces client is individualized. So we're taking a look at all cases that they have open within the county. We're taking a look at them holistically and not like what we're actually seeing just for one particular charge. And prior to working in these programs as a prosecutor, I was mostly concerned with the cases that I was working on and maybe the defendant, if I can wrap up certain charges. But in this program in particular, we're trying to take a look at what can we do to reduce the barriers for this person so they no longer have to utilize um, the county emergency programs, the jail, et cetera. Next slide, please. So there have been two evaluations done since this program first started. It really launched in 2016. So there was an evaluation between July 2016 and um, 2017. And then there was another evaluation between 2017 and 2018. We're currently going through an evaluation from uh, 2018 through 2022. I think that everyone can understand that due to the pandemic, there has been a lot of delays and we are expecting different results um, based on services being closed during the pandemic and the lack of congregate settings. Uh, as you all may know, congregate settings are often where People, for example, will go to sober support meetings or people will meet with their case managers or have supportive programmatic based meetings. Those were completely shut down starting in March 2020 in the King County area. So we are expecting different results. But for the preliminary evaluations, we can see that the vital program, the familiar faces, uh, clients were actually able to utilize the additional resources that they were provided when they were part of the program. So we see just numbers such as a little under 600 consultations with the medical professionals, around two, over 200 consultations with an occupational therapist, which is also something as a prosecutor for myself, I never really thought was significant to have someone be an occupational therapist for folks um, who are experiencing houselessness and then for the first time are being housed. They, there are a lot of folks who don't even know how to maintain their space or getting from point A to B using what we have um, for our public transportation is our ORCA card. People didn't know that they have to go load their card you know, at a certain station. And that's, those are all of the little things that an occupational therapist helps them with. And then you can also see uh, about 100 phone consultations with nursing staff and 100 contacts with peer support. 
Next slide. So the case managers for our vital participants are their number one resource because their case managers are what connect the familiar faces client to everything else. So we can just see numbers between 2016 and 2018 is that there was a little less than 3000 hours of case management with vital clients. I want to bring this back to the beginning of the introductions to the presentations today. Rebecca was saying that we need to make sure that uh, programs like this that are based on data need to constantly have check-ins and um, talk about how the data is being collected. For the VITAL team, we actually have monthly check-ins with all of the service providers, including the case managers, so we can see what are our definitions moving forward of how we are going to be um, collecting data and is this still working and with the evaluation that will be coming up this summer we're hoping to see if we can increase the amount of familiar faces clients that we have but in general um, case managers average about uh, two and a half hours every month for every client um, which then does help those clients reduce their utilization of emergency rooms, um, 911 calls, or um, community check-ins for our law enforcement officers. Next slide, please. And so these are the pre preliminary evaluations. And I will say again, since it, the evaluation, these are based on 2016 to 2018. So I wanna put that caveat in there, but more than 78% of the vital clients through the through familiar faces were booked in jail less often once they were enrolled in the program for at least six months. And that is uh, the definition of the enrollment for at least six months was chosen because the vital case managers identified that folks in the first three months need to build rapport with their case managers. They need to feel comfortable that this program is going to work for them or is not going to leave them. Um, we had heard from a lot of clients specifically that they had been a part of uh, different court processes. They've been a, diff a part of different outreach teams, um, but are often, I don't wanna say failed out of those programs, but maybe they didn't graduate. So they no longer were accessing those services. So there was a lot of, trust and rapport that had to be built the first three months of case management. But we we see now that the vast majority of vital clients have fewer bookings per year after their enrollment. And I think anecdotally, I will say that it probably has a lot to do with the fact that it is a housing first space model because a lot of the vital clients were being contacted on the street. Um, and the last point I would have to say here is that a typical vital client had at least two fewer bookings into a King County jail compared to the three years before entering the program. And I'm bringing it back to that because when we take a look at the data, the criteria of someone being a familiar faces, a vital client, they had to have been booked at least over eight times in the past three years. So the fact that every year they're reducing their jail bookings is is a positive and i'm not sure if every county or every jurisdiction has been dealing with this since the pandemic but i anticipate these results to be a little bit varied taking into account 2020 to 2022 because all of our all of the jails in king county have had different criteria in booking, especially during the pandemic to reduce obviously the congregate settings. And so what do we know from this actual data? We know that the vital clients are not utilizing the services that the emergency services that they would prior to being a vital client. And why is the prosecutor still important for programs like this? It's really one of the main things is the prosecutors end up being the meeting point for many of these different silos. So we see people coming uh, in contact with the criminal justice system 
because of poverty, because of um, lack of housing, because of uh, behavioral health substance use issues. And we are the ones that actually can say, okay, well, this person already has X, Y, or Z going on with them for these particular cases. They are currently being overseen by our Department of Corrections. How can, how can the case management team actually help this individual so that they don't have to use these emergency services? But I do think that seeing the, the preliminary results and going through the second, or I guess third round of evaluations now, the county has seen benefit in these programs. It doesn't work for everyone, but it is for a continuity of care for these individuals, knowing that there are case managers and there are resources, regardless of them entering into the criminal justice system, has provided consistency um, and a reduction of utilization of the emergency services since this program has been around. And I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Leandra. That is incredible information. I, I just think about all of the work that went into deciding how many, um, how what a familiar face would be defined as. Um, that's such an innovative way to to really start addressing. And I love countering it or comparing it with with Joy's program as well and, and Mike's program because it really addresses two of the things that people have struggled with: as FTAs, um, people not being able to appear for their cases. And then people continuing to get um, to get repeat cases and not really addressing the root causes of, of why they're coming into the system and, and at different points in that system. Um, Do you want me to so ask know, any questions now? So I was going to say, we're just about to turn to our Q&A session. I know we had some prepared questions, but I really want to make sure that we're answering the audience's questions. So um, I will go back and we've collated all of your questions. So please continue to send them in. Um, I believe if we can, we'll start, we'll, we'll send the first question over to, um, well, I guess whoever wants to, um, to answer from, from, from your jurisdiction of Redondo, Redondo Beach, um, you mentioned that there was an informal diversion agreement. And, and does this informal nature of the agreement impact its efficacy? Have you seen it impact the efficacy of the, of the agreement? So we call it informal versus formal, where in our diversion programs, formal diversion requires a plea, uh, not um, guilty, no contest, and then sentencing it over. Um, it could be put over six months, a year, or to an update. Um, informal does not require that plea. And that actually helps the person in that if a plea is entered, even though it's not a full conviction on your record without the sentencing, um, it might affect their housing eligibility and finding apartments or permanent housing. And um, it, I think it's, it encourages people to accept the services and be part of the program when they don't have to enter that plea. Did you wanna add something, Mike? I would say only that there are multiple diversion programs in California courts, and there are frankly easier ways to get these quality of life charges dismissed or um, get the punishment over with. I think what attracts the public defenders uh, to support the program is there's no easier way to make services so readily available and set the individuals up for success. And I think that's why we have um, such high attendance and such high participation in the program, because they're coming to a very non-threatening way, which is near where we picked a site, a parking lot that's right across the street from a church that provides uh, lunch service uh, to the homeless. So many of them were going to be there anyways. And by bringing all those services, they're willing to do the work uh, in order to get permanently housed. That's incredible. And I think that speaks to just the buy-in from all of your partners um, and your work setting up this program to really get that buy-in from each stakeholder to be present, to have their booth, to, to really work with these individuals. And that's so important. 
Um, and I think it's something that you've both you've really all touched on in your program. So I can certainly appreciate those points, which brings me to kind of the next question that came in is housing. You know, housing is an important part of this program and housing is an important part of both programs, really. So is housing a benefit of the court graduation or is it a requirement? That's both. Yeah. In, in order to graduate from the program, you do need to be permanently housed. But during the program, you're not required to be housed. You don't have to be in interim housing to be a part of the program. That's the goal. And um, so the steps getting that they may find interim housing on the way there, but you don't necessarily need to be housed. And, and, and you know, many people have multiple cases come to it. And so Joy will sequentially, segmentally um, dismiss those cases if somebody is really showing uh, active participation in overcoming the the obstacles that remove them from becoming permanently housed, and so it, it's a, an incentive and a final reward, but it's a huge benefit to them. Absolutely, and I think I think it's such a credit to both of your programs that they started really pretty closely to to the onset of the pandemic, which I'm sure created some unforeseen barriers. I think I've heard the term unprecedented times more times than I can count. So I am certain that it, and it's such a credit to both of the programs that they were able to, to really tangent and, and just make those quick shifts. Um, are there uh, other I, barriers? I, 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 I will say uh, it's a bit of good fortune as well, because I don't think I'm creative enough to come up with the idea of going to an outdoor court or persuasive enough to convince LA County to do the, do the first one in our parking lot. But because of COVID and it's, it was an ask risk population, um, that's why we wanted to keep the, the, the success going, the attendance going, and it had a whole other benefit. And so now there are two other outdoor courts in LA County. Wow, that is, the most silver of linings I've I've heard yet to the pandemic, but if you can find a way to make that um, that barrier such a positive, I'm that's incredible. Um, were there any other barriers? And this, you know, to, to to you, Leandra, as well. Were there any other barriers to your programs that you identified and were able to to work around? You know, so barriers to the program sort of vary by year, but I would say that. What we're up against right now is the lack of mental health resources, especially for those who are acutely mentally ill, but don't meet the criteria to be involuntarily committed. So there are folks who um, may be cognizant at times to sign a release of information, but then when we continue to start working with them, we realize they need a much higher level of care that the team cannot provide. Um, and right now we're seeing a large lack of mental health resources because someone has to be very mentally ill to be committed in, in a hospital um, or they're, they're not, right? And so it's finding that in between. And I think that that is a really large barrier for at least the systems in general in Washington state right now, because um, that high level of care, unless you are in in crisis, is not necessarily available. I would agree that the lack of resources is a huge barrier. Um, getting permanent housing right now is difficult for a lot of the participants, uh, particularly those who don't have a, um, a credit history. Uh, a lot of landlords don't want to accept emergency housing vouchers. So it does prolong the process and, um, mm -hmm. and getting them the treatment that they need for mental health and substance abuse. Sometimes there's a waiting list, um, but it, it is the, the resources available that is a barrier. I would say they're just obstacles that we have to evolve to overcome. And so, for example, some people don't have their birth certificate and didn't know how to get them. And Joy did a lot of research and the other, our other prosecutor um, eventually was able to convince us judge to sign a court order. And 
this person has identified as this individual for the last 20 years and D of me had to take it so she could finally get her um, ID so she could get her benefits. Um, TSA to help uh, reunite a schizophrenic person who had, who had just left his family in Texas and had been on the streets of Southern California for a while. We were, long story, but um, we were able to, to prevail upon TSA that um, a booking photo could be a second form of ID for travel. And so he was able to, to fly. And, enjoy, and so we're looking at what can we do to help uh, people um, improve their credit because that is is an obstacle. So uh, there are barriers, but the whole idea behind these programs is they evolve um, to to meet those obstacles. I think that again speaks to just the ability of your offices to continue to collaborate because those are not things you certainly don't learn that in law school. Um, they don't they don't teach you that there. So it is incredible that you know and I, this speaks to your ability to to collaborate with these partners and really think of these creative things um that you can do to really address the needs of the people that are that are on your on your desk as a as a paper file to begin with um really so i want to um looking at the looking at the questions that are coming in how many clients um and i think this question is is intended for 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 you, Leandra, was, first, yeah. um, how many clients per case manager do you have? So it's 15 clients per one case manager. So in, in at least in Washington state, that's a low caseload for uh, a, like a social worker. And that's why we're saying that they're intensive case managers, because with only 15 clients per case manager, they're able to walk that person to court. They're able to go to the Department of Licensing with them. They're able to... Um, go make sure they could go pick up their birth certificate and things like that. That's great. And then and then I know that, um, I think Demetrius is gonna join us in just a moment with a follow-up question, but what were the data points or the key data points that started um, and that led to starting Familiar Faces? And I know just so our attendees are aware, we can send them the link to the website that I believe has all of those um, initial data reports that really led into the Familiar Faces Initiative, but um, if you could give a brief overview of what the key data points were that led to, to this initiative. Definitely. So we, even though there are um, therape therapeutic alternative courts in our jurisdiction, we still saw that there were a number of high utilizers. So people who are involved in the emergency systems were concerned with the same folks coming in over and over again in the jail. So jail utilization was one of the number one priorities because like I said during the presentation, our courts weren't holding folks very long anyway for these really low level offenses. So it was just a revolving door of people coming in. So jail utilization was one really big concern and the use of nine, the 911 calls for very, for calls that were not necessarily appropriate for 911 and the walk-ins to the hospitals. Again, those are folks that need help, primary care, and should not be using the emergency room, right? So those were some of the main priorities that came out of the county to create the initiative as a whole, along with um, the houseless population, because we've seen it steadily increase. Absolutely. And I'm going to turn it over to Demetrius because I know he had a follow up question based on um, your answers so far. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. I just had two follow up, two follow up questions. The first, I, I'm both to both presenters. You talk about access to services and the issues with access to services. I was wondering if there was some benefit with being involved in your program where the the barrier to access or um, getting certain services is cut in half because you all have that buy-in from the different social services, specifically housing, right? Because we know that there's a lot of red tape when it comes to housing. So is there opportunity, some of that red tape is bypassed given the collaboration and just the prosecutor being involved in those cases? I'll, I'll kick it over to Leandra. 
So yes, there is a, a benefit. Once a person is a vital client, like I was saying, Plymouth Housing Group is one of the partners. And so there are actually set aside housing units for vital clients. And so if someone becomes a vital client and they want to be housed, because there's always a caveat that not everyone wants to be housed, but if they want to be housed, they can have um, a house available or a space available, which is really not like the regular King County um, housing programs. Usually there is a assessment that's done and you're ranked. And then based on your need, that's how they get housed. But as soon as you're part of this program, if you want to be housed, you can be housed. The other thing is because the prosecutors are involved, we're able to um, get a lot of additional data that social service providers are not. So when it comes to getting someone their license, their birth certificate, um, or helping them get employment because we have those records, that I feel like is a benefit that those resources, those barriers for those resources are cut in half because you have someone directly working in the system that can provide you copies of that information. Wonderful. Same question, Joy and Michael, if you had anything to add. Yeah, so we in Redondo Beach have the, Mr. Webb mentioned the tiny homes, the pallet shelter, and uh, people who go through our housing initiative program do have priority for that. That is interim housing. We are currently working on a more permanent housing project. Um, and when that gets set up, I imagine that the same kind of priority would be available to them. And as Leandra mentioned, you know, when I'm trying to order a birth certificate, checking that government agency really expedites the process as opposed to when the housing navigators or outreach workers are trying to obtain it for their clients. So there are those benefits to, um, you know, cutting the red tape and, and trying to expedite certain things. And I think that um, having all the services together in one spot helps a lot. A lot of people were not getting housed because as Joy mentioned, they didn't get their past convictions expunged from their record, even though they were legally entitled to it. They just couldn't go through the process. So the uh, public defender sends a special mobile expungement team to homeless court uh, once a mo every month um, to uh, for everyone to be able to access. And you don't have to be a defendant to access any of these services. Uh, Joy passes out flyers to all the um, provider of meals um, a week before the event and people do walk in and avail themselves of those services. Plus the non-threatening nature makes people, the Department of Mental Health finds their uh, effectivity much higher um, in delivering their services at homeless court than they do um, um, even than merely going to a homeless encampment or some other approach or waiting for someone to come to them. And so uh, even the service providers find it uh, beneficial to be in that group setting, which is has become very encouraging. They're they're encouraging each other through the process, which was um, surprising but very gratifying. Thanks, Michael. I had one follow up question, but I do want to be aware of time and realizing that we need we only have about ten minutes, twelve minutes or so left. So I do want to move on to our the the roundtable discussion piece um because this is really where we like to have the opportunity for participants to think through and learn from each other and those who are on the call about what's going on with their program so that there's some thought partnership and exchange um you'll next slide please on andrea um you'll see that there's a series of questions we have four questions it's not likely um, two on this slide, two on the next slide. It's not likely that we're going to get um, through these questions given the time that we have left. But I will encourage participants when you get the slide to actually look through some of these questions that we're asking you so you can begin to think about um, some ways to impact your program if it's, in, in fact, a program where you're looking to work with prosecutors in a diversion program. But 
At this point, what we wanna do is ask you all each question. Um, if you have a response or a thought on the, the question, respective question that we on, I'm gonna ask that you raise your hand in the chat. Once you raise your hand, we will take you um, off a mute and allow you to ask your question and you'll ask your question, put you back on mute, and then we'll take a series of questions and or responses to other, other folks' responses to the question, um, and then move on to the next question and do the same thing in turn for each question or as, as time permits. So the first question that we wanted to kick it out to participants who have been thinking about this, but been having issues or just thinking about ways to think through is, are there any particular considerations that impact your ability to effectively partner with prosecutors in diversion programs? Um, and now that you have prosecutors on, on the line, definitely take advantage of asking them how you could address um, some of these impediments that you may be having. So this is the first question, opening up to pan, um, participants. If you've had any considerations, have any issues, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this question. Any, any takers before we possibly move to the second question, and we can always come back if the questions come up. I can make a comment on this one. Perfect, Deandra, I love it, thank you. Um, first of all, I would say that I, our office has taken an approach and I strongly believe that the criminal justice system has been rooted in racism. And so there are a lot of community members that don't trust prosecutors. Prior to going to law school and becoming a prosecutor, I didn't trust prosecutors. So there is a lot of rapport building that has to be done with collaborative programs like this for folks who are even buying into the program to trust that we're not going to um, use the additional information to harm those individuals. So, I mean, social workers that I work with didn't even trust to talk to me for at least the first three months that I was involved in the program. Can Wonderful. I add Thank on to that? Oh, absolutely. I think that is such a great point, um, Leandra, and having worked in social work and, and then on the legal side, there's such a difference. But I think also one of the barriers is the difference in language that we use. Um, the definitions and the words and how we communicate is so different in, in the behavioral health space and the, in the criminal justice space that when you find that person that you're able to communicate with and or, or starting to engage, really laying out the definitions and what you mean by what you say, which I appreciated, you know, throughout your presentation, you were like, what I mean by this is, um, I think is so crucial to, to starting that collaboration, starting that program and, and an effective partnership. Absolutely, building trust um, is, essential, is especially important in these type of programs, especially with people who feel the system, and it's in fact, the system has caused harm through racism, and as well as um, not uplifting systems, not uplifting those who may have um, specific disabilities, whether it's mental or behavioral health, that mistrust is huge. And so overcoming that is ex extremely important. Um, any other thoughts on the first question before we jump to the second? I'll also add that I think the trend with criminal courts is going towards restorative justice, at least in California. So I, I would just throw out emails to every prosecutor you can get contact info to, and I think someone will respond and um, be open to starting a program. Uh, and e even if it's the head, prosecutor, district attorney, or a deputy that will refer you to someone higher up um, and, and wants to start that program, I think now is a good time to, to do that. Wonderful, thanks so much, Joy. The next question, um, and uh, this question can really can be for anyone, but it's really formed in the way that folks who are working in programs, whether they're programs, diversion programs, whether they're diversion programs directly working with the prosecutor, but just questions in terms of um, your data collection and how you're collecting data. And is your, you, are you using that data in an effective way? Particularly, are you using that data to tell your story 
of how you're impacting and, and improving the lives of your participants. So any challenges coming up or thought suggestions to participants for this question? All right, we can move to, the, to the, the third question on the next slide. Thank you, Andrea. All right, another question to consider whether he or in the group is once you have your data and your data is collected, what you want to think about ways that you can reconceptualize your partnerships with prosecutors, right? And so is there something that is being identified that in, in terms of a gap in the program that you all can have a workaround and rediscuss. Again, as the panelists were saying, it's very important to have regular and frequent meetings amongst your partners so that you are evaluating the data in real time so that you're working to identify those gaps and ways to improve the program. So just wanted to um, open the opportunity to think about is there ways um, in your diversion programs, whether it was prosecutors or not, where you can reconceptualize the work given the information and data that you're gaining or ways that you have done that that you thought were beneficial. All right, so the final question is that, I, that you should consider is what offices in or near your jurisdiction, and I really think Joy was speaking on this, are in your jurisdiction operating prosecutor-led diversion programs that you can learn from or could be champions for your programs. I think that you should definitely think about that um, and thinking about ways to connect with them. And if you can't connect with them or there's some challenges, think about why or why not you couldn't connect with them. And for the why not, think about expanding your collaboration, thinking about your data, being able to present it in a way that can open up some of that discussion um, so that you can possibly begin to open those lines of communications and build those collaborations to champion your programs. The all right, so we'll move on. Um, the next is we have a list of resources here that we want to offer you in case you want to um, dig a bit deeper in your program um, and some things to consider as we discuss doing, doing the webinar. I'm going to drop those into the chat box so that you can have those handy now, have that handy now. So again, these are the list of the resources. Next slide, please. Um, you will see um, that the presenters have been al already so gracious to provide their contact information in the chat box. Um, I wanna thank them for doing that. And I also wanna encourage you all to take advantage um, if you're interested in, in seeing their thoughts and in their experience and as, as you think about developing your own partnership with prosecutorial-led programs. I also want to offer both Rebecca and my contact information, just in case you have um, follow up for us and or would like for us to facilitate some discourse between you and any of the presenters. And then finally, if you haven't already, I want to really encourage you all. The next slide, please, Andrea. Thank you. If you haven't already, I really want to encourage you to join the, C the CSU Justice Center newsletter. This serve not only is it a great way to learn about funding opportunities such as the Justice, the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Training and Technical Assistance Grant, but you will also receive information on upcoming trainings and webinars such as this, as well as other resources um, from our agency and our partners. I also like to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted along with the recording and the slide deck on the CSU Justice Center's event website event page um and then finally i want to thank you all for joining this webinar and i especially want to thank 
our presenters, Rebe our speaker, Rebecca and APA. I also want to thank our panelists, Michael and Joy, as well as Neandra. I really, and I just saw Michael drop his contact information in, 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 in the chat. So I really would encourage y'all to speak to them. And I just want to thank you all for taking the time to speak with us about your wonderful programs and all the great work that you do in your jurisdiction. All right, I will leave. I think, I think that's it. We'll leave it there. Everyone have a great day.